it used to be, you know, things pop off, you get pissed off, you go home, you do some shopping, you eat, you whatever, and you got a few months, then something comes back up, you have some time. This is back to back. It feels like an attack in a very real way. What about our black young men out here on the street killing each other? Just the date, three o'clock this evening. Another young black man, you know why that bothered me? Because that young man was involved in my son death. Even though my mother was a poor widow, white widow, right, immigrant widow in this city, I, I was born with privileged expectations. Other young black men in, in public housing and those, they think that all white people are no good. They do, they got people that still think that. Back in the 60s, when I was at LSU, we thought we resolved a lot of this, you know, that people were going to come together. We we're so young and foolish to think that we solved the problem, right? There needs to be a, a shift, a dynamic shift, and a perspective shift in every individual. And a perspective shift in the individual is how they envision themselves and how they identify with themselves. And that is the only way I see, because it starts with self first. Well, I signed up for the Welcome Trail because uh, at the, it came at a time when I was actually thinking about race relations. I'm starting to see a reoccurrence of a lot of racial problems, and, uh, and I just wanted to get involved to find out what is really going on. At first, I wasn't sure whether or not it was just going to be, you know, a situation where, you know, it's African Americans beating up on the whites for everything that you know, the whites have done wrong for all these years. And, and, you know, I was hoping that it was not going to be that type of environment, that it was going to be an environment to where we start learning about each other. And that's one of the things that came across in some of the very initial uh, meetings that they had where they were, you know, just floating the idea of doing this. Race and reconciliation is something I've always been interested in. And I work in the community and I understand how the power structure and the dynamics affect the clients that I work with and how it affects oppression and poverty. And then we had the series of other events that were in the media that were making that even more visible and tensions even a little bit higher around it. My family owned Evergreen Plantation. My father and all of his brothers and sisters, except for the youngest, were born on the plantation. My great-grandfather ended up purchasing it after the Civil War. Even though my great-grandfather never owned slaves, you know, they did have African Americans that were working, you know, because a lot of them stayed, you know, after the Civil War. as it is that day, two day, two day, you know, and, and, and just try to just live somewhat happier and to do something positive or to help somebody else or help another mother, help another child or something within that day's time. That helps me. I thought Katrina was the worst devastation of my life, but uh, my son, the man, Brown all, lost his life. I'ma talk about my wife, cause he was my child. Yeah. He said, mama, don't worry. He said, tell my story. Yeah. Talk about your wife. Everywhere you go, whoever wanna know. Wow, man, deep. 
In my situation, my son has scarred some other family. It's been, what, eight years since my son committed this crime. And every time I'm faced with it, it's like, it's the same day. It's the same moment. It hurts me so much inside that he has hurt, it, hurt other people that shouldn't even I don't deserve to be hurt. I can look at you and, with a lot of respect mm -hmm. and be very thankful that you have the courage to do what you're doing. I'm thankful for your lot, and I'm thankful that she did have enough courage to share when I asked her, you need to let everybody know just how the mother from the other side feel. We all lost children. You've lost yours, we've lost ours. But at the end of the day, we gained a family. I am a community leader. I believe by helping my community, I am helping my world. And in these situations, I truly wonder, what am I doing all this for? We gotta talk about what happened. We gotta understand it. And as I related to Eric, his biggest challenge is not coming into the black community to see what he can do. His biggest challenge is confronting his family, his friends, his coworkers, his community, his neighborhood. I don't care what you call yourself. <laughs> I don't care what strata of the economy that you exist in and are comfortable in and call home. This mess gets everybody. And the only way we'll clean it up is to get everybody together, get some soap, get some water, and get to it. I guess I just want to know what we're fighting against or who. And so I, is it voter apathy? Is it suburban whites? Is it corrupt politicians? Or is it this nameless, faceless force of capitalism? What I've realized is policy helps, but it's who, who are the people that are doing the thinking behind the policy? And then most importantly, who are the people that will be doing the executing of the policy? Because trust me, most of our laws are probably really solid if you had good hearted, clear-headed people executing them. The state of Louisiana incarcerates more people than anywhere, not only in this country, but internationally. Yeah. That cr most of those are African Americans. When America is ready to acknowledge that the African slave trade, it was like no other slave situation ever. It was violence. It wasn't just servitude. It was a rape of the spirit. It was a stealing of the mind. It was breaking families apart, tearing mothers from their children. So when you take the minds and the spirit of people, what's left? How do we not think that that affects our families today? It reverberates even today. And so until America is ready to recognize the capital advantages that slavery and that violence on African people, that the wealth, the gross wealth for that top 2% is based on the blood and the suffering of people, then we can't have a racial conversation. That means that's meaningful or that will lead us to reconciliation. As a young man, um made some mistakes in my life. I uh, made some mistakes. Uh, 
um, wound up going to prison. Wound up going to federal prison um, because I I sold drugs. You know, I wanted to escape um, poverty. I wanted to be to help my family. And I remember coming home, um, applied for a job. Um, the box that said check off your convicted felon. I left it blank because I know if I had checked it off, then I wouldn't have had a chance anyway. So I just left it blank. So the manager gave me the job. You know, I was delivering paint for about two weeks. I was doing an excellent job. You know, I busting my ass. <laughs> I was. I'm talking about doing good. At the any time they called me to come and work, I was going. I'm like, shit. If somebody gave me an opportunity. Yeah. Damn, I got an opportunity. Yeah. So um, after two weeks passed, he walked me in the office. He said, man, I try to talk to the region. He said, man, you're a good worker. He said, you're one of the best employees here. He said, but it's their policy, man. We got to let you go. I sold drugs, too, but not because I wanted to support my family. I just wanted to sell drugs. And, um, and I wanted the money that came along with selling drugs. And, um, and I was good at it because I didn't do that much. Um, I drank a lot, but I didn't do that much. I was arrested nine times, um, and I never went to prison. My uncle was the chief justice of the Supreme Court of Louisiana. Because of who I was, I didn't have to... I didn't have to suffer the consequences that you had to suffer when I was doing the same thing. It's an opportunity for us to make a step towards something that could be bigger, right? We could do interviews about Mardi Gras, we could do interviews about religion, we could do interviews about uh, the river. The young people would not just have their hands in the production, mm -hmm. but they would have their, their minds and hearts in the brainstorming of the piece. Reconciliation requires an acknowledgement that something bad happened. Then it requires an apology. And so that is step one. So in this day, let me, as the chief executive officer of this government, in this city, that at one moment in history sold more slaves into slavery than anywhere else in America, apologize for this country's history and legacy of slavery. Public heart has been used to influence and inspire the public and tell their stories. To communicate at a glance. To be imprinted by a sense of something only requires seeing it, sharing space and time with it. Visuals speak to our hearts and souls unfettered by thought. Our project outcome will be a permanent visual and audio art installation of Algiers history. We believe this project will reach a diverse public and initiate multiple conversations to allow residents to move past our fear and apprehension and explore how we together create a more positive and equitable future. First, we'll design and place historical markers around the city so that we can illuminate our past. Second, we'll host public events so that people can learn from and empathize with one another. And finally, we'll create a curriculum and other resources that'll help teachers across the city teach our young, young people about the history of race and racism so that they too can join us in this work. We will identify historic landmarks and places in the St. Rock neighborhood where we can host conversations and learn about how racism is affecting us all. We will promote and host a series of public dialogues and story circles, providing local residents with opportunities to share among themselves cultural trends, experiences, and values. I came into the circle thinking, hey, I'm open, I'm ready, I can do this, I understand it. I grew up in uh, the 50s and 60s in New Orleans as a minority because I was Jewish in Catholic New Orleans. I got this. No, I didn't. 
I had miles to go in my learning experience. It was a very difficult process. I was expecting to be frustrated, and I was. <laughs> I was expecting to be angry, and I was. And lots of times I went home exhausted and ready to let it go. But it challenged me. It challenged me, it changed, it transcended the way I thought of myself and my perceptions and beliefs and how I saw other people. Knowing everything that you know now, having experienced everything that you've experienced, how many of you would go through this process again? Well, I think that's unanimous, people. So thank you all so much.